everyone, and welcome to our Quebec Conference Revival Series, Jesus is the Answer. We are so thankful that you have spent today with us. We're having a series over the next few days, tonight, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday morning. We're so happy that many of you uh, have joined from all over the world. We are going to be having health nuggets on how to survive depression, a testimony from Nicholas Kabul, and our speaker of the hour, Carl Johnson. Our theme song is something that you know, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him, there's no other, Jesus is the way. Let us hear the Theodore family.
Hello everyone, this is Shani and Isabelle for mm -hmm. Mieux Vive and Vers Jésus. Hi Isabelle. Hey. I wanted to speak to you about something. Uh, because as you know, I went through two depressions in the right. past. Mm -hmm. And a second time, I went and got help at uh, the Depression and Anxiety Recovery Program of Dr. Nedley. Mm -hmm. And as I was going through the program, learning the tools, using them, mm -hmm. I was getting better, which is fantastic. Yes. But something really specific happened as well. Okay. I uh, got more and more interested in spiritual matters. Hmm. I was a Christian through my depression as well, but spirituality was not something really attractive to me anymore. Hmm. So at the end, I was well, and I even had to a certain point a spiritual awakening. Hmm. My question to you is this, was this all a curious coincidence or was there something more? There was something more. Actually, it's a good question. You know, Shani, it's been proven now scientifically that the frontal lobe has a huge impact on three major things, uh, being spirituality, morality, and the will. Actually, just to clarify a little bit what the frontal lobe is, there's, you know, the brain has different lobes and the left and the right parts of the brain towards the front are for convenience referred as the frontal lobe. And this is actually the control center of all our conscious brain functions. So when you blink your eyes or when you breathe, it, it's not necessarily related directly to the frontal lobe, but all of our conscious um, brain functions are related to that. We're even including judgment or reasoning or intellect or the will actually. Well, that's something great to know because, mm -hmm. of course, uh, for anyone, it's important. But mm -hmm. I, I would even say for a Christian, it is, it's even more so important because we right. want to have a, a healthy relationship with God, mm -hmm. right? For sure. And what happens actually when our frontal lobe is not doing well is that there's not enough blood uh, flowing in that area. And so we're, we're kind of literally in a cloud sometimes when there's not enough ox oxygen, there's much less activity. And that explains a little bit of what we're talking about here, not really having a lot of interest or morality going down. We don't have any willpower to make decisions right. that would make positive impact on our lives. So speaking about uh, the frontal lobe and spirituality, mm -hmm. you know, it makes me think of a, of a Bible verse. Doesn't the Bible talk about this area of our body? Yes, actually, the Bible does talk about the forehead. And um, it's in Revelation, the last book of the Bible, the last chapter of the Bible. So that's talking about the redeemed, the people that are saved and that will be in uh, that will live for eternity with the Lord. And it says, on verse 4, they shall see his face, talking about God, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Mm. So that really speaks to me because when we talk about his name here, we talk about God's character. And we know that God wants to have his character in us. He right. wants to transform us. And he does that through our frontal lobe, through our forehead. And so this is where God communicates with us, transforms us so we can be more like him. Hey Amen. That's amazing. Thank you very much for sharing. And mm -hmm. you know what? I, I think the main takeaway here for people who are listening is that whether you're struggling with depression, anxiety or not, if mm -hmm. we take good care of our mental health and more specifically maybe our frontal lobes, um, it can have a positive impact on our even our spirituality, which is something fantastic, mm -hmm. of course. Right. Mm -hmm. So we wish you take care of your frontal lobe now that you know, right? And before letting you go, um, we want to remind you of uh, two resources uh, that are available. So it's in French, so whether it's for you or for someone you can share it with. For anything uh, health, we have a YouTube channel whose name is Mieux Vivre and we encourage you to visit. Mm -hmm. And we also have Vers Jésus for any spiritual content that you would benefit from. So it's our YouTube channel called Vers Jésus. Thank you very much, Isabelle. Thank you. And thanks to everyone at home. Yes, take care. Bonjour, je m'appelle Chantal, je suis de la région de Montréal. Avant, c'était, j'étais croyante, mais euh, de façon éloignée. Je savais que Dieu, que Jésus était là, mais souvent dans ma vie, j'étais trop occupée. 
Puis c'est seulement dans des moments de tristesse ou de désespoir que souvent, là, je me rappelais et que là, je me, je me remettais à prier. Donc, euh, et la plupart du temps, quand ça allait bien, mais là, je continuais mes activités. Puis, dernièrement, ces dernières années, euh, j'ai souvent ressenti comme un grand vide, un grand manque. Puis, euh, j'essayais comme de combler avec toutes sortes d'activités. Puis, euh, c'est quand j'ai rencontré une amie, euh, Nanou, euh, il y a environ trois ans, c'est elle, elle était très croyante et puis c'est elle, tranquillement, qui m'a remise euh, sur le chemin de Dieu, si on veut, mais d'une façon totalement différente. Donc, euh, je me suis mise à étudier la Bible avec elle, puis tranquillement, euh, j'ai comme redécouvert Dieu, j'ai redécouvert ma foi d'une autre façon. Puis, je gardais ça dans mon cœur. C'est aussi à cette époque-là que j'ai accepté Jésus dans mon cœur pour la première fois. Puis, euh, je suis ensuite dé déménagée, j'ai changé de quartier. Et euh, on, on restait en contact avec Nanou, mais plus que j'avançais dans l'étude, plus que je découvrais Dieu, que je découvrais Jésus, puis euh, des, des choses extraordinaires, plus que j'avais des questions qui avaient besoin d'être répondues par quelqu'un peut-être qui a plus de connaissances. Fait que là, j'ai commencé à penser peut-être à fréquenter une église. Puis à un moment donné, euh, pendant l'été 2018, dans, dans la poche, j'ai découvert... Euh, une petite carte que c'était que c'était une invitation à une conférence euh, la seule vraie source de joie fait que moi ça m'a tout de suite intrigué j'ai regardé j'ai vu que c'était euh, l'église près de, de chez moi puis c'était les adventistes du septième jour j'avoue que je connaissais pas ça m'a vraiment conquise donc j'y suis allée presque tous les soirs et j'ai comme créé une relation là bas j'ai commencé à aller le, à leur culte les samedis euh, j'ai commencé une étude, une étude biblique avec le pasteur Youth et euh, vraiment, j ai, j ai, j ai, je me suis vraiment appro approfondie euh, avec Dieu. Ma relation s'est vraiment approfondie. Et même en, en 2020, quand que, il y a eu la COVID qui, qui est arrivée, au lieu d'être défaite et d'être euh, euh, démolie, si on veut, au contraire, moi, ma foi a s'est solidifiée encore plus. J'ai continué mes études. Euh, euh, sur, sur les plateformes euh, numériques, euh, on, on avait la chance de pouvoir suivre les, les cultes. Donc, euh, ma foi, elle a vraiment grandi encore plus, même dans une période de, difficile comme ça. Et à un moment donné, un samedi, lors d'un partage, il y a un déclic qui s'est fait en moi et j'ai décidé que j'étais prête et que j'allais me faire baptiser. Fait que là, maintenant, à, tout, à toutes les semaines, avec le pasteur You, je me prépare pour euh, le baptême. Euh, maintenant, tous les jours, euh, même plusieurs fois par jour, euh, je prie, euh, je suis vraiment en relation avec Dieu. Euh, je, 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 vraiment, je, la Bible, j'en ai jamais assez, je veux tout le temps en savoir plus. Et sincèrement, à un moment donné, en faisant mon bilan de l'année 2020, j'ai réussi à euh, accumuler au moins 25, euh, 25 gratitudes que je pourrais donner, euh, que, que j'ai eues dans cette année-là, qui pourtant a été difficile. Et, ces 25 gratitudes-là, je me rappelle que c'est souvent avec la prière. Puis maintenant, j'ai vraiment l'espérance. Et quand vraiment ça va mal, je me rappelle qu'il que, qu y a des belles promesses que Dieu nous a fait. Puis c'est vraiment ça qui me permet. Et maintenant, je sais que je suis plus seule parce qu'il y a Dieu, il y a Jésus, il y a l'Esprit-Saint. Mais il y a maintenant mes frères, mes sœurs. The speaker of the hour is none other than Carl Johnson. He has preached the gospel in West Africa, French Polynesia, Quebec, and in France, where he now lives. He is a professor of theology, and he has appeared on It Is Written, Hope Channel, and 3ABN. He is married and has two beautiful children. Today's topic that he'll be presenting to us is Jesus helps us to understand today's time, the time we are living in. Before we go to the message, I would love to read you a Bible text taken from Acts 1, verse 6 to 8, and it reads, Therefore, when you had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Bonsoir. 
Good evening or good morning, depending at which time you're watching this video. I'm very happy to have you listening, and I am sending you respectful and brotherly greetings. I am glad to have in mind all these people that I met when I was a pastor in the province of Quebec. Um, I think of the churches of Saint-Léonard, Laval, Saint-Hubert, and Mauricy, and when I was a pastor in Ontario, on Oxbury, the Church of Ottawa and Gatineau. But I'm asked to present a message during a seminary or a conference. The first question that comes to my mind is that of my public. Who am I addressing myself to? And according to the title I'm given, this public I am to speak to takes a different connotation. The theme I was asked to talk about is Jesus is the answer. It is an affirmation. It is a statement we believe. Therefore, I ask myself, do I have to explain to believers that Jesus is the answer when they already believe it to be so? I think that I will confirm more than anything, maybe present a little bit more light on the topic. I could also present the topic in a different way. Is Jesus the answer? Then I face a public who is seeking an answer, a different public than the one in France where I'm currently working. They practically have no knowledge of what Paul refers to as alliances. These topics are foreign to them even though they are the basis of the Christian faith. Paul would go as far as to say that the life of Jesus, the life of the Spirit, is also foreign to them. So this public is far from Christian, but is still pondering on existential questions. Where, where do we come from? Where are we going? What is there after death? Why is there some suffering? How do we obtain happiness? I would like to address during my presentation this Christian audience as well as the seeking audience who I hope is also listening. Allow me to remind you of a song of the mid 60s. It was during the hippie movement. Those of my generation probably remember the messy hair, the washed jeans and ripped jeans, the colorful and flowery shirts. There were these young Americans or Europeans who would um, arrive in Nepal or in provinces of India and seek out gurus with white beards and try out meditation, contemplation, and the drugs of another world. In this song, we find a description of that search, that questioning about the possibility of a different world through the wanderings of the spirit. We stumble into the labyrinth of starless nights and sunless days, hoping to find out a hint or find a pathway to truth. But who shall ever shall answer? Where do we find our hope? Is it written in the stars? Is it within us? Who shall answer? The song does not tell us who has the answer. And it doesn't tell us what the answer is, but who will answer. We all look towards someone who would be a leader, maybe a government leader, and who would incarnate the answer to our questions. Someone whose opinion, whose advice will answer for us. What are the means of knowledge? Where can we find out this knowledge? Do we have any sources to help us answer our question? Henri Consporville is a highly mediatized philosopher in France. And in his book, Groundless Moral, he explains that we can interrogate history, but history is ever changing. It is man made. Therefore, we can't expect too much of it. 
One could interrogate science, but science can answer as to how things are done, but not why they are. We could interrogate nature, but nature has no moral. COVID-19 is rampaging after all. We do have roses, but they have thorns. Nature has no moral. We could interrogate men, but he is so mediocre. We can only expect the worst from him. And so according to this philosopher, all these different pathways lead to dead ends. And I can now understand this remark, this question that Peter made in the 10th chapter of John. It was while Jesus was making a speech on the bread of life and about his blood, who was also source of life. And Jesus spoke this weird statement. He said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. The Jews did not understand what he said. And they abandoned him. And so Jesus turned towards his disciples and asked, do you not want to leave also? And Peter answered, no, you have the words of eternal life. To whom would we go? You have the words of life, the words that breathe things into existence, that give a meaning to life. I do not know how you're now coping with the COVID-19 situation in Canada. All governments are now collaborated with a scientific committee. It is the same thing in France. Just like Bernard-Henri Lévy has written, another philosopher, this virus is making everyone crazy. We see scientists going crazy. They are contradicting each other. They are insulting each other. Whether on the topic of masks, vaccines, or preventive measures, we've heard anything and everything to a point where we have to wonder if science is even able to tell us anything clearly. Edgar Morin, who is a scholar in France, who is now 99 years old, has written the following statement. Science was legitimately called upon by the authorities with the power to combat the pandemic. However, the people who were initially reassured were soon confronted with the unexpected remedy proposed by Dr. Ryle, to the opposed medical information from certain doctors, and to the fact that informed people had found out that great scientists were collaborating with pharmaceutical industries. And so COVID led us to understand that science is not a repertory for absolute truth. These theories are biodegradable on the basis of new discoveries. So science does not hold the truth. I'd like to read to you a text from Bertrand Russell, who is considered to be the father of modern atheism. Does the theory of evolution, the only one being taught from elementary to university level, give us any insight about the meaning of life? Russell tells us that man is the product of a cause without objective. Man's origin, his development, his hopes, his fears, his love, and his beliefs are only the result of the fortunate assembly of atoms. In other words, we are but masses of neurons, as Francis Creek, the father of DNA, would say. No enthusiasm, no heroism, no intensity of thought or feeling could preserve the life of the individual human being beyond the grave. The text being quite long, I will therefore summarize it. This man of science leads us to understand that nothing awaits us, if not despair. 
He says in the end, it is only on the scaffolds of these truths and only on the foundation of absolute despair that the human soul could now build its home. Therefore, there's not much to expect from science. It seems evolution has no aim or purpose. So where should we turn to for answers? And these questions, they are the translation of our profound needs. We need explanation to these needs. I'd like to quickly go over these needs. Firstly, there is the need of lasting love. The cry for lasting love. Farouk Boulsara, Farouk Boulsara also known as Freddie Mercury, on l'a vu dans sa chambre, dans une chambre was found in a hotel room, son vomi, soit de lying sang, dead in his own vomit, either from AIDS we'll rock you. or maybe we are the champions. from taking his own life. Les plus connus. We will rock you. We are the champions or his most uh, popular songs. The miracle. And when he dedicated his last album, The Miracle, he said the following, we could own anything and remain the loneliest men on earth. And that is the most cruel of solitudes. He explains that he had everything in his life. Money gave him the means to everything, absolutely everything, except lasting love and the feeling of being loved. And this man who is ruling over a universe of money, a world of possessions, and in the end took his own life. I think about this 45-year-old woman who suddenly comes to learn that her parents did not want her, that she came to be by accident. When she learned that truth, she took her life the same evening. We need not only to know that we are loved, but we need to know that we've been loved before our very birth. We need that feeling of eternity. Here in Quebec and in Canada, as a pastor or a priest, we can conduct ceremony for marriages. And sometimes I can still hear this man who called me late at night and asked me, Pastor, could you marry me? And when I ask to know why he is so pressed to marry and why he is calling me so late, he tells me he is in a hurry because his friend is dying from cancer and he doesn't know if he'll be able to marry her in time. And so I ask him, why would you want to get married in these conditions? And he answers, because I want to prove to her that I will love her forever. Where does this longing for eternity come from? This desire that goes beyond the grave. These memories that are kept inside us about the departed beloved member we would like to see again. There's a thirst for eternity. A thirst for forgiveness. Either asked or received. We cannot forgive ourselves. That is popular psychology. The sentiment of guilt is at the heart or the core of human nature. We need somebody else to forgive ourselves. There's a thirst for justice. And so many questions about justice. Black lives matter. This cry resounded throughout the entire humanity. This plea for justice, for the individual to not be judged by the color of his skin or his social economic status. Justice, a, th a thirst for truth. Sometimes I hear people say to each their own reality, but that is not true. There is an absolute truth. Besides, we are ready to pay crazy amounts of money during a trial to find out the truth. We are ready to hunt down the tiniest details or hints able to tell us the truth about somebody who passed, whether a member of our family or 
about an event in our life. We have a thirst for freedom, especially during this period of COVID-19. There are in certain countries uh, protests that result in violence because people are tired of being confined. They feel restricted and they have the impression that their freedom is compromised. There's a thirst, a desire to reach for other worlds. If you go into any bookstore, you'll be surprised by the amount of books on the topic of aliens, uh, astronomy, uh, paranormal activities, the growing number of people consulting their astrology readings. This illustrates the desire to contact with something that transcends. There's a thirst, a desire for a better world, a world without COVID-19, a better world. Every three years, every five years, in every country of the world, we vote on a political party and we pretend that this party will lead us to a better world and that it will change things. There's an aspiration within us for a better world. I think about this poet Sully Prudon that says, I carry within myself the uncurable desire for a terrestrial paradise. Victor Hugo would breathe in and breathe out this desire. And so we come to this important question. Does Jesus have an answer to all these questions? Since science cannot help us, and since nature, mankind, and history cannot bring us any answer, as Sponville said, do we have another source able to offer answers to our questions? I would like to propose that Jesus can. It's been said that together, all the armies of the world all the ships that have sailed the seas, all the parliaments that have seated, and all the kings that have ruled have not affected the world as much as Jesus has. We could ask ourselves, in what type of world would we be if, the, if Christ had never existed? So together, let us try to identify traces of his presence throughout history. Et même dans notre histoire. and even in our own individual stories. I'd like to think first about his message. He didn't write any books, but his biography exists in four different versions and has been translated into 2,000 languages. We have about 10,000 manuscripts about his message. He is the figure in history for which we have the greatest number of written accounts. There are many figures in history whose existence are not questioned, but ironically, we doubt Christ's existence when we have so many accounts for his life. He is, without a doubt, a historical figure. Suéton en parle. Pin le jeune en parle. He is mentioned by uh, Roman authors and Jewish authors. Le Talmud en parle. He is mentioned in the Talmud, in the Quran. Son message. Son message. Et là, je vous fais remarquer quelque chose. His message is, is that important. And I'd like to bring your attention to something very important. And that is that it takes about 20 years for a message, a concept, or an idea to go from the philosopher's mind to the people. It takes 20 years for that transition to take place and for an ideology to be popularized. Jesus lived 33 years, and his public ministry lasted only three. And after three years, his message transformed the world. And we will come to discover this. Something impressive comes to my mind, something extraordinary. 
There were always messiahs in Israel. And when Jesus was there, there was Barabbas, Tudas, there was this Egyptian man, and Barsheba, who were very influential men, men of great renown, who had powerful connection and networks. No one mentioned these men. They disappeared. Jesus, the poorest of them all, the one who was less known, who had no beauty to draw our attention, Jesus, est le personnage de l'histoire he is the greatest man in history. Et il a dit quelque chose And he says something that completely revolutionized the Jewish context of his time. He introduced himself as the son of God, as God himself, which is a blasphemy, a sacrilegious comment that would bring us to ask ourselves how did this message from this man God, from this incarnated God able to make Christianity the greatest religion of the world? Who was he in the end? Is he one of us? Physically, emotionally, psychologically, intellectually, he is one of us. He is our brother. A reading of the gospel illustrates how easily he could relate to us. But on the other hand, he was different. He is different. He is different. He's unique. unique dans sa conception. He's unique in the way he came to be. In his birth, he was born from a virgin. His life is unique. You couldn't see in his life any flaw. Who will convince me of sinning? What he say? And Pilate would say, here is the man, the perfect man, the ideal man. One in whom there is no flaw or defect. His life was revolutionary. He was revolutionary in his relationships at the time. He mingled with people of lower status. He mingled with people who were marginalized. He was revolutionary in the sense that he fiercely attacked religious traditions. His behavior was so shocking that it put his life at risk. His life was revolutionary because it was a life of truth. And as the song from Guy Béart says, he will be executed. For saying the truth, he will be executed. He will die. Like a villain. Like a cursed individual. He will not fall to an accident or disease. He will be executed. A little later, Gandhi will follow the same path, just like Martin Luther King. And every time that in this world somebody defends um, people of lower status and tries to demonstrate that there is no racial difference, there are no difference between men and women, that person was executed. There were certain aspects of that unique life that we understand by faith. And every individual is free to believe or not. His resurrection is unique. His ascension to, to heaven is unique. And surely his second coming will be something unique. Let us speak a word or two on about his resurrection. We will not be able to go over every aspect. I remember that in Quebec, back in saint georges de beauce there were talks about a bleeding virgin. Now, in popular Catholic piety, these uh, incidents attract crowds, although the church does not approve of these kind of talks. But after a while, the police published a warning. Because these rumors can be easily manipulated. And so the police let it know that if if they were to find the source of that manipulation, he would have he would receive a heavy fine and even time in jail. And a few hours later, surely enough, the man who had manipulated this event surrendered himself. So he surrendered himself to be imprisoned for a legend that he had fabricated. So why would it 
be that the disciples who were hiding on Friday and Saturday because they feared being lynched, how would they have become heroes and founders of the greatest religion in the world? And went as far as dying as martyrs. If you want to ask me for proof of resurrection, I would like to say that the size of biblical texts, there are none. But this testimony by the, the disciples, who they themselves did not originally believe, the fact that they go on to die with hundreds of others because of this resurrection, and because of this message on resurrection, is a very powerful proof. Would they have died for a fabricated legend? Dear friends, you who are listening, who, who might be septic, I suggest that you go even further. I have showed you traces of Jesus in history. Let us now go over your history. I remember that an evening, my daughter-in-law was visiting us for the first time. And I asked her what she would like to visit in Paris, in France. And she asked, she answered that she wanted to go to these American um, cemeteries where you have these great monuments and you have these the names of all these Americans who died um, during the conflict between Hitler and the Germans. And she had a, an uncle who had passed away in France, and so we went there. And when she went back, she was excited, and, and she called up her parents and said, I found his name. It was really him, and his history now had a distinct truth to it, because the name of her uncle was inscribed on that monument. A few months ago, I received a letter from someone I did not know. It was actually an email, and she said, I'm one of your cousins. And she was working on her gene genealogy. And I was happy to learn that. And when I met her, I was trying to look for family traits on her face. We're always happy to find people who are part of her history. Please understand, you cannot trace your story or history without including Christ. He is at the center of your story. Your story finds its meaning through him. How so, would you ask? Well, it is true. The European calendar, which is a universal calendar, starts with Jesus. There's this parenthesis before and after Jesus Christ. I was born in March 17, 1945, and I'm able to interpret these numbers before or after Jesus Christ. If you remove this before and after, these numbers are meaningless. Maybe you won't take that into consideration, but you can't ignore the fact that your story finds its meaning thanks to Jesus Christ. This is what Frédéric Lenoir, who is a religious sociologist, says. The essential element of life, of social life, and our calendar is based on the birth of Jesus Christ. And it serves as a criteria for dating history's great events and um, the life of every individual. So follow me closely. Si vous êtes en infraction, si vous avez commis un crime, if you've committed a crime, si vous êtes juridiquement poursuivi, if you're liable uh, in face of the law, un choix, and you're given a cho choice, faites face à votre procès, you can either face trial, dans les pays islamiques, in China Inde, or in Islamic countries Germany, or in India or Burma, ou alors, or au Québec, in Quebec, au Canada, in Canada. Dans une ville de l'Amérique du Nord. In a city of North America. Or in Europe. What would you choose? Would you choose to be tried in China, in India? Ou l'Amérique du Nord. Or in North America, or Europe? Je ne pense pas. 
que j'ai besoin de deviner votre réponse. I don't think I need to guess your answer. Pourquoi Why is that? Parce que vous êtes plus ou moins assuré Because you're more or less assured absolu, que si vous êtes jugé that if you're judged in a western territory which is rooted in Christianity à votre dignité humaine. you will have a right to human dignity au fait que la vie est sacrée. You will have a right to the sanctity of life. Individu à part entière. And you will be recognized as a individual in part of mankind. À la liberté. You will have a right to freedom. De l'homme. And rights to qualité. Sont des qualités d'inspiration chrétienne. And all these rights are from Christian inspiration. Undoubtedly so. Of course, we we don't think about this. We just live it. Pays de racines But chrétiennes. We live if countries rooted in Christianity. Que le christianisme without recognizing se it. Dans romain. And when Christianity developed in, under the Roman Empire, his, its message was, a, was foreign. Chez les romains, aussi the sanctity of life was a foreign notion. Social systems were hierarchized. Et oh, la liberté non plus And freedom pas, did not exist. All saints Dieu. were submitted to Tout the will of the gods. This entire message, si, présent dans les pays ever so present in the Western countries, du come from Christianity. So you're profiting from a world that is rooted in Christianity. Votre histoire, your history and your values stem from Jesus Christ. Hier, à ma euh, le, euh, le Yesterday, surprisingly enough, I heard the Minister of Justice state in France, que la loi as we were discussing uh, separatism, that laic law was placed above the law of God, Les valeurs, which was an aberration. The lake values are inspired from the Bible. Even the principle of lay city gives to Caesar what is to Caesar and to God what is to God comes directly from the words of Jesus. And so I was trying with these two points, your history, your story, your date of birth, and the Christian values, I was trying to show you traces of Christ's message. I could give you any type of information about a chair, but in order for you to truly understand how robust the chair is, you'd have to sit on it. And together, we have sat on historical facts that demonstrate that if we propose that Jesus has the answer, it's worth believing. It is a credible statement. Let's once more touch on a more detailed topic. Man needs God. He might have repressed that question, that need. It could be that that feeling is repressed, especially in a Western and secular world. The notion of God is as old as time, and up to this day, it has not disappeared. There is, is in men, five fundamental needs. The first being the need to worship. D'adoration. C'est Dostoevsky, écrivain russe. Dostoevsky, a Russian author, says, Man needs to worship. He needs, he has this need inside him of the infinitely great. And if he doesn't find it within him, he will seek it somewhere else. But he needs to project onto something else this sentiment, this feeling. And Simon Will says the same thing. Man either worships God or something else. He'll even worship other human beings. And this non-Christian society is filled with gods. God of the stadium, God of the small screen, God of the big screen, God of fashion, God of money, God of dictatorship. We are surrounded with divinities. The need to worship is fundamental in human beings. Il a besoin d'un Dieu visible. He needs a visible God. C'est Job. And Job, l'Ancien Testament qui dit, in the Old Testament says, yeux, Do you have eyes chair, of flesh? Do you see the same way men see? Do you hear the entend. same way men hear? Oui, il a besoin yes. de savoir. We need to know lui est proche. that this si God is close, that this God is visible. 
All great non-Christian religions are filled with many representations of God. There are 33 millions in Hinduism, and even the strong branches of Christianity, like Orthodox, for example, cannot stray from these representation of divinity, even though the commandments said that you will not bow down to false images. Even Islam, that says that it is a religion without representations, says that the Quran has, represents God. And so that illustrates how much the need to see God in one shape or another is deeply rooted. A visible God, a God in its image, a God that is close, a personal, a, a God to which he can identify. And Christianity is the only religion to introduce to you such a God, a God that saves, that can save us from death. Jesus says, the one who's seen me has seen the Father. Yes, the one who's seen me has seen the Father. He was the print of God. He was God with us. That is his most specific message, his revelation of God, his relationship with God is unique. It is a flawless relationship. And that is an overview. I invite you to ponder on. De ma présentation. And I'm going to go into the last part of my presentation. And I'd like to address myself this time directly to all Christians, Adventist or not, who know, who believe that Jesus is the answer. The purpose of Jesus' revelation is his second coming. He who said before leaving for heaven, let not your hearts be troubled, believe in God and believe in me. There are many houses in my father's place. If that was not the case, I would have told you, I will go and prepare for you a place and when I will have left and prepared that place, I will come back. I will take you with me. Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And in the first chapter, we discuss Jesus coming back with glory and majesty. And it's written that all eyes shall see him. And in another chapter, it says that he will come back on a white horse, not as a frail infant, but as a king. And in this book, who is not as enigmatic as one would think, ends on this statement. Amen. Come, Jesus Christ, Lord. And yes, let not your hearts be troubled. It is in tranquility, calm and confidence, says Isaiah, that your strength is found. I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that the second coming of Christ is at the core of the Adventist message. And the Seventh-day Adventist message gives great importance to the time surrounding his coming. There's even a scenario of the end times right before the coming of Christ. And I'd like to remind you that in all times there was a the apocalyptic fever surrounding the coming of Christ. And it's an essential question. How should we await that event? We have to pay attention to the signs of times. And the COVID-19 is a sign of the times. But we can't forget, dear friends, that when Jesus says, when you see these things, know that I have not yet come. There are signs of time and there is the sign of time. The sign of time is Jesus himself. And that's the reason I'd like to draw your attention to the dangers of an exalted expectation, of an obsessional expectation, of, of an overexcited awaiting of that second coming through behaviors that might seem obsessional. Be careful. I was asked to speak on that topic. Be careful. Because psychologically, 
There is a distortion that is called cognitive dissonance, which means that we have a pre-established scenario and we will seek any information through the media that will corroborate that scenario. Even when presented with evidence that will contradict it, we will cling to that scenario to the point where we will falsely interpret evidence from current events and adopt a cult-like, sect-like behavior. And I would like to address the Adventist community, as I have said, in our community, there is a person whose writings have a considerable importance, and her name is Ellen White, and she wrote about the cities of her time and cities in general, and there are several quotes in which she says, flee these cities, and throughout time, there have been people who, at the first signs of times, have sold everything in order to live in rural areas. I'd like to touch on this topic since it was asked of me. There are a small part of people who are fleeing towns. We have a compilation of her writings on this topic. So what does she really say about it? I have reread these writings who date back a hundred years and who describe cities as uh, places of pollution and debauchery and she announces judgment will fall down on these cities, and she asks parents to save the souls of their children by buying territories out in rural areas and building schools there, and she says that the church should have all these institutions in these rural areas, and that church members should not huddle around these institutions and create miniature Jerusalems. But she also says that will be syndicates with opposing views to that of God. So she, spo she speaks of many things, work in rural areas, work in the country, but she also says, on the other hand, that we need to go into the cities to continue the proclamation of the gospel. So if there are people to, that are to go out into the country, there are people who are to come to the cities in order to fulfill the mission. And she says, just like the Jews felt at which time they were called to flee Jerusalem, likewise, there will be a sign for us to know when to exit the cities. And that will be the Sunday law in the apocalyptic scenario according to the SDA interpretation, the fourth commandment will be used as a test of loyalty. But dear friends, at the present time, there are absolutely no signs of that eventuality. Let us beware and not force things to happen. Even here in Canada, for more than 20 years, the Sunday law has been completely obsolete. The Minister of Justice Dans le débat sur le séparatisme entre les and the Minister of Justice on the debate of separatism between state and the church repeated over and over and again that the state law was above God's law. So we're so far from a religious ruling. And so when Ellen White, a hundred years ago, speaks of the rise of the papacy, it is only in 1965 that Paul VI first visited the United States. And it's only in 1984 that diplomatic connections were established between the Vatican and the United States. And when President Kennedy was named the first uh, Catholic in the United States, people uh, submitted that he would be the Vatican's puppet, but that was false. In his first speech, he said that the state laws would never be submitted to the religious laws. It might come to happen, it might come to pass, I do not know when, but we cannot cry wolf when there isn't any. Let us be balanced. I just want to throw in a few more information bits 
to close this parent assist. Throughout times, cities have been described as places of perdition. And when she speaks of cities in her, of her time a hundred years ago, as if they were already based on the model of Sodom and Gomorrah, I'm not quite comfortable with that. I've lived in Paris, Montreal, Trois-Rivières, and I have yet to feel that I was living in Sodom and Gomorrah, the way that the Bible presents it. Rappelons aussi très clairement que tous les systèmes de gouvernement ne sont pas les mêmes. And I just want to remind people that all systems of government are not the same. There are some areas where we're not allowed to have a, a religious schools in rural areas. D'un contexte. And so we cannot use a context, a specific context, and use it as a blanket statement or a universal truth. So we have to analyze individual contexts first. So, dear friends, I want to share with you this message. I want to convey this message. Let us not go, let ourselves go to exaggerated enthusiasm. If we have truly integrated or internalized these biblical principles and the notions that we are already saved in Jesus Christ, when the kingdom to come is already present in our hearts, when we know that through Jesus Christ we already live the promises of the jo joys to come. In other words, whether he comes tomorrow or later, it does not really matter because within my heart I live in his return. As Paul said, Christ is my life and death is gained for me. And if I live, it is Christ who lives through me. And faith through this perspective invites calm and invites us not to let ourselves go to excessive, excessive excitement in Calm and trust, we will find our strength. And so it would be interesting to find out how should we should await that second coming. I'd like to invite you to read closely the parable the words of Matthew 25. There are five parables that put emphasis on the following facts. We have to wait that. We have to wait that event. We have to be vigilant, like in the parable of the thief. And as you wait, do not be idle, but be hardworking. Um, give out food to those who need it. As in the parable of the talents, continue to multiply the gifts that have been given to you. And as you wait, make sure that your lamp of oil is filled with oil. Um, work on your salvation. And most importantly, as you wait, take care of those around you, those who are sick, who are the orphans, and those who are suffering silently. That is what the church should be doing in times of crisis. Beloved friends, I'm aware that this COVID-19 situation is making us understand certain things. And I'd like to quote Edgar Morin. I was surprised, he said, a hundred years ago. He, he saw many crises during that time. I was surprised by the pandemic. And in my life, I usually expect the unexpected. The rise of Hitler was unexpected. The, the alliance between Germany and the Soviet Union was unexpected. The start of the Algerian War was unexpected. I've lived for the unexpected and the crisis. But today, but today I see elements of totalitarianism present, the way that countries of freedom and democracy respond to the COVID-19 demonstrate elements of totalitarianism. And this crisis has nothing to do with those of the past 100 years. But there are so many means of collecting information, drone, facial recognition. There are many ways 
for totalitarianism and surveillance to take place. This is what the book of Revelation explains. And Jesus is telling us that he'll be somewhat late. And sometimes, you know, my wife, she gets restless when we have a guest coming over and who is tardy. She wonders why aren't they here yet. And I always make her take note that when that guest asked at what time they should come, she answered, whenever you want. And now you can't get impatient. Friends, why are we impatient when Jesus himself says that he will be late? Watch the for for you know neither the day or the hour where your master will come. The master is tarried just like the bridegroom was. So maybe it's better to say he'll be coming back one day. Which day? The day that chose has determined without your will. Que Dieu a choisi the day that God has chosen in his time, nous, what matters to us is for us to be prepared. Et je termine, and in closing, tout simplement par un événement. I'd like to simply remind you of an event that took place in chapter 11 of Acts. Famine, There was a man named Agabus who predicted a worldwide famine. Sous le règne de l'Empire Claude, de l'Empereur Claude. And that took place under the reign of uh, the Claudius Empire. And what did the Christians do at the time in the Antioch Church? Among them were people who had listened um, to Jesus' speech on the mount. And nobody cried, ah, this is a sign of time. Jesus is coming back. No, on the contrary, they were asking themselves, what can we do? How can we help those that will be affected by this crisis, by this worldwide famine? Who among the church members would be ready to travel hundreds of kilometers to help and leave those who have been affected by this famine. And that's what we must do while we wait for the second coming. We, will, we, we should visit the sick. We should visit those in prison and those who are uh, weaker. We should not close ourselves off in prayer, endless prayer. We should continue to care for others who are in misery and who are in need because in our hearts, the coming kingdom is already there. May God bless you. And may those who had not really pondered on these answers from Jesus Christ, on the meaning of life, may they et qu'ils puissent retrouver dans leur propre histoire find the time to ponder on these things and on the message of Christ pas accorder du temps à tout cela we could not give much time to all of this we're so busy with everyday life primaire bien que je pense qu'à de temps en temps but I do believe that from time to time existential questions will come back to us. I believe that Jesus is coming back soon. And I like this song that I used to hum in my childhood. If he comes back tomorrow, if he'll come back after the day after, if he comes back later, that's fine. I'm ready to receive him. Thank you. Hello, everyone. The song that you're about to hear is called Water. It was inspired by the earthquake that shook Haiti in 2010. A man that had been buried under the rubbles for 28 days was pulled out alive. And when he was asked, how come you are still alive? He said, a man in white brought me water. That's what he needed to live. We are facing a worldwide catastrophe. What does the world need to live? We can become the hands of Jesus that help, the hands of Jesus that bring water. Jesus is our answer to a world that is suffering. We can also be Jesus' answer to a world in need. May God bless us.
on dirait que c'est arrêté la terre Devant le désespoir et la misère De cette vie qui s'envole en poussière La terre, une prière S'est élevée au-delà des frontières Cherchant une âme toujours prisonnière Et qui respire encore sous les pierres Une prière Les océans Et l'on voyait un jour sur nos écrans Un homme que l'on sortait du néant Ce chant Mais comment Comment as-tu survécu si longtemps Pauvre marchand Et c'est là qu'il nous parle de l'homme en blanc I'd like to thank Shirley Johnson for that beautiful rendition and Carl Johnson for the message. And last but not least, we'd like to thank you for being here with us tonight. We want to welcome you tomorrow again at 7 p.m. We're going to hear from 
Dr. Neil Nedley with his message. Let us pray. Father God, we are so thankful for the many blessings that thou hast bestowed upon us. We're so thankful for the message and the nuggets that we've gained in today's message. Please be with us, help us, protect us, guide us, and bring us back safely tomorrow. These and many mercies we do ask in thy dear name, Christ Jesus, amen.